Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Liam. Um, I run a blog called The Rude Baguette, uh, as Pierre said just before. Um, and I'm here today with Kevin. Uh, Kevin, you want to talk about some of the hats you wear, depending on the day of the week? I, I think the hat that I'm uh, most uh, familiar to people with is a, as an artist, as a visual artist. I work uh, primarily with a camera. I think you call that a photographer. Uh, I think of myself more as an anthropologist, though, trapped in the body of a visual artist who happens to work with a camera. So uh, I'm doing a lot of portraiture, celebrity portraiture. Uh, uh, that would be the stuff that uh, is more high profile. And uh, I, I'm dealing with matters of existence and identity, I, 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 uh, approaching things from an ontological perspective. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, most, most recently, for me, I mean, uh, was the big... Uh, gallery they put on the permanent display in the Dublin airport and it was of the Ireland's most famous uh, entrepreneurs leaders innovators um, and and the big thing is I mean from, from is this typical almost almost simple black backdrop straight perfectly aligned um, and it almost pulls out I feel like when you when you do photos you almost pull out more than you bring into it like you almost you almost strip everything down where it's just Every single person looks almost the exact same, and so how do you how do you play with how do you play with identity when you're when you're doing that? that well, that, that's, I'm glad you see it that way because that's the idea: is that whether you photograph a head of state, uh, a notorious criminal, or uh, somebody who owns the corner, uh, you know, fruit shop, that uh, once you remove the the facade, the mask of identity and persona, that what you should be left with is just a portrait of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the human existence, uh, the human uh, experience. And, uh, and that's what I go for. So uh, in, in, I think it's, it's precious, in fact, our sense of identity uh, and sense of self, but we mustn't lose uh, sight that we're part of something much greater, uh, society, community, and that at the very core, we're made of the same stuff. I, I completely agree. It seems like with with this combination of the internet age and, and globalization, where now identity seems to have played a really big role. Like now more than ever, it's important to be French on the internet. Now more than ever, it's important to be, you know, nationalist or politically like every because the internet takes everything to the Reddit extreme. Uh, you really have you really get pushed into identity, and I see a lot of people. It, it, for me, it seems like a huge crutch. Like I think of identity as like, if you try to describe your identity as something constant, you're ultimately gonna get screwed over because you change and, that, and your idea of who you are doesn't and you get pulled. And so, I don't know. I, I, how, how have you seen how people relate to identity change? Well, identity, really, when you look at it, it's, it's a function of, of how we uh, would like to see ourselves, the uh, others' perceptions of who we are, and there may be the reality, for lack of a better word, of what we are. Uh, and, and it is in flux and it is changing. And when identity manifests in the, in the sense that we are, we are always trying on masks to see what's, what we're most comfortable with when we present ourselves to the world. Uh, and we wear, we wear masks and that's okay. Mm -hmm. We're all stripped and vulnerable. Uh, uh, we might not uh, be able to function like we do. Uh, and and I, I think when you, uh, the more, the, to, to speak to the t topic at hand, with the more connected you are, uh, the more this sense of identity and self uh, becomes threatened, for better or for worse. I had this, um, on, on, that, on that same vein, I had this amazing experience. So um, I don't know, I, I've told this, to, I told this to a handful of people, I've told this story before. Um, when I got into college, uh, it was around the time where Facebook had just arrived at the university I was going to when they were still doing this university rollout. Um, and uh, my, my real, I guess we'll say first name is William. Uh, and so for 18 years of my life, I was William Bogar, Will for short. Uh, but online, I had taken to the habit of signing all my emails, Liam. Uh, and a couple years before, Gmail beta had come out and I'd gotten Liam.Bogar just as a sort of shorthand on the internet. And so when I got into college, I'd created a Facebook account and out of habit, I put Liam Bogar on it. Uh, but everyone that I knew up until then knew me as Will. But I went to a college that none of my friends went to and at orientation, everyone asked the same question, which is how can I find you on Facebook? Which first of all, amazing product that in like 2006, that was the go-to question. And I said, oh, well, I'm on there as Liam Bogar. And everyone said, okay, Liam, see you later. And in a matter of seven days, I had a completely different name. And it was unreversible. People had met me and I couldn't, I couldn't undo it. And so much so that it's 
still my name today. I just sort of went with it. But it was a really amazing experience because suddenly... So Facebook has changed who you are today? Substantially. Substanti and I'm like, I am... Are you a better, a better person for it? Well, I think it was... A, so I, I have the combination advantage of having done that and then subsequently having left the continent that I was born in, which I don't... If, I think if you haven't moved to a different continent, country, hemisphere, do it. It's probably the most amazing experience because you learn a lot about who you are because when no one else knows what you've done your entire life, they don't treat you with that context. And so the big thing when I went to college is because I had a different name, I didn't have the perceptions of who I was because people weren't calling me by the name I was used to. So everyone had been calling me one name my entire life and I had this idea of who that person was because that's, that, had been, that had been reinforced by the people calling me that. And then suddenly I was in college and people were calling me a completely different name and I could decide which things I wanted to keep and which things I wanted to get rid of. And what's cool is I found, I found out that a lot of things are inherent to who I am. I like making jokes. I like being social. I like organizing parties. Like really basic, they seem basic things, but I like doing these things and it didn't matter you know, if I started from scratch or not. And, and so it really helped to reinforce my sense of identity and figuring out what, what was me and what was being imposed on me by the people I had been around three years of context. Are you an active Facebook user? I am a power user. Okay, so tell me about the stuff that you share with your, fr your friends. I, so um, almost everything I put on Facebook is set to public. Um, because I have a philosophy which is, uh, if you don't hide anything, you can't get caught. Um, and so far that's worked fantastically. So I share almost everything. Uh, I've written thank you letters to people who loaned me money so that I could move to France three years later saying thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. Uh, everything. I do put some stuff on just friends. Uh, when I, uh, for example, put albums up of my vacations with my girlfriend, who would prefer not to have strangers see her on vacation. So when it brings in other people, I'm respectful of their, I tend to default to the most private of the people I'm interacting with. Um, but other than that, everything uh, is public. And I have absolute, I, I am the advocate of, like, Facebook doesn't care about my user data. They care about 1.1 billion people's user data. Like my, if I left Facebook tomorrow, like, like you did. Like I did four months ago, yeah. Then that would not change Facebook's end game. I am not that important to them. Yeah, I'd like to make it clear I'm not anti-Facebook. Uh, I did go, and like all, we can all do, we can, we can download the archive of all our activity that we've ever done. Have you ever done that? No, I haven't. Okay, let me tell you, one of the things that you come across, which I, I, was, I was really uh, impressed by, every private message you've ever sent in Facebook is archived. And it's strangely archived in chronological order. It has nothing to do with, uh, it's not or, it's categorized by who you're talking to. It's just this, from the day you signed up with Facebook, the day you, you leave, it's all there for you to see. And I saw some things that I said in there that taken out of context would probably land me in jail. And, and, I, and I'd be willing to bet that half the people in this room have said things, uh, inoc seemingly innocuous things uh, in Facebook or on a text that taken out of context and used against you by an individual or, a, or a, an organization or a government would uh, turn your life upside down. And uh, need, I think I might have to <laughs> invoke the name of Cardinal Richelieu, <laughs> a quote that's been attributed to him. I'm not sure if he actually said it. The thing about six lines taken uh, from the hand of the most honest man, and uh, you'd find a way to hang him. And uh, this scares the hell out of me. Yeah. I think that it could be uh, a matter of age. I'm 45. I speak to 18-year-olds. And I ask them about what they think about the implications of, of something like I just described, or a photo of them sitting in a pool of vomit, you know, coming up uh, when they're applying for a job at a respectable company. And they don't, they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, they don't see the issue. Like, well, everybody has a picture of themselves lying in a pool of vomit. You know, so what's, what's the big deal? And your employer might have been the guy taking oh, he the was, photo. Abso <laughs> absolutely. So, so uh, does this concern you at all? Um, well, one, I am lucky to not have those many of those photos. There is one amazing photo of me, which you can see because I left it up there, which is me when I'm 18 hosting my first party in college, and I am clearly not doing too well, um, in the good way. Um, having a, and I don't mind that. That's part of my life experience. And if I was at an employer and they say, tell me about your first party in college, I would tell that story. And I would love to have that photo to supply with them. I use Facebook as a journal of my life. And just like before, anyone could read your journal if they walked into your house, which despite having a lock, anyone can do, uh, especially with a subpoena. Um, I treat Facebook like that. And I, I find it a lot more comforting to put everything out there and not have to hide anything. 
uh, than to try than to say I'm going to hide stuff because I don't want people that, to find uh, right it. Right away, it sounds like a proactive uh, approach to something that you're in fear of. It sounds like you, in fact, you are in fear of something, and that's why you're trying to perhaps uh, to mitigate the damage. By, by coming out and saying, look, I have nothing to hide. Look at this. This is all, I put it all out there. No, it's not like, look, I have nothing to hide. It's like, do your worst. It's almost like a challenge to people. Like, people, I've, I've had people challenge why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. I write, a, I criticize the French government, and I never studied political science in my life. Uh, and people come out, and I say, that's okay. I know absolutely nothing about that. I studied Latin. See, there it is. I, I'd be just and, curious. Do, uh, anybody with a show of hands here uh, have a problem with uh, data collection, personal data collection? Does anybody here actually care about up. big companies collecting a lot of data about you, data you're not even aware of? Yeah, there's a few people there. Oh, yeah. Uh, does it bother anybody that a company, like it could be a Facebook, it could be a Google, it could be anybody, but that they might know things, well, they do. They, they, they know things that, uh, about you that you don't even know. Uh, with predictive AI now, they can, uh, they can deduce uh, what's going to happen to you potentially tomorrow before you even know. Uh, maybe they'll know the day you're going to die before you're going to know. Maybe you don't want to know. I don't want to know. But, but, but what do we do when our sense of self and who we are and who's in control is, uh, is being impeded by this massive machine of intelligent or quasi-intelligent data that's being used? Uh, and, and let's make no mistake that you're more val valuable to everybody, uh, in the, the big companies, when you're vulnerable and you're naked. Uh, and we know that people in the, say, in the, in the name of convenience will, will disrobe very quickly to, uh, to, uh, uh, for, for, for convenience uh, and, and give up their privacy. Uh, I know that in, fr in France and in Germany, uh, they've taken some stands against this. Um, yeah, but I think, I think it's not a question. I, I don't think the internet is that important to my identity. Right. Um, and I write about it all the time. Right. I just think it's a very interesting economy that has really awesome implications, like infinite distribution and real-time communi like communication. Right. Those are amazing concepts. Um, but I don't think, like, I, if Facebook was like, we, based on what you've used of the last nine years that you've been on Facebook, you're going to die at the age 43, I'd be like, okay. And they'd be like, well, and we can get more precise if you keep using and our this product. Is, this is what's so interesting about it, though, because we're, we're, we're most concerned with the present. Uh, we, we, don't, we tend not to look so much at the future. All this data we're talking about and all this intelligence they're gathering, it's maybe, yeah, it doesn't affect, life is good, look at you, you know, successful, blah, blah, blah. But how is it going to affect Liam, uh, if that's your real name, in, uh, in uh, 10 years from now? And uh, how is it going to be used in ways that you had, you had no idea it would be used? I hope it will be used. Yeah, against I, you? I maybe? mean, do you remember when there was a time where every time you like, wanted to use a new product, you had to create a whole profile, and they're like, what kind of sports do you like? Now I just use Facebook. And it's amazing. And they know who I am. And what that means is, if I go on a product for the first time and they don't immediately give me something valuable, I'm like, you know who I am. You have nine years of my life. Arguably the most important nine years because they were the most recent. Would you like opportunities potentially to be shut off to you based on things that they've gathered intelligently from your data? I think they, they probably have. I well, they, I'm sure they have. I think people make assessments <laughs> about you already. But before yeah. we were doing that based on like I, I saw the guy walking into the room and he's got his shoe was untied. Right, right. Now at least they're using smart. It's not like people weren't doing this before. They're just doing this within a rich data set of different things. Like I can't find out whether your shoelace is untied or, or whether you don't iron your clothes uh, for an interview you know, on, on Facebook, but I can find out other stuff. Yeah, well, I, 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 I would say I have some, somewhat of a fear of, of this data being skewed by those in control of the data to mm. achieve their various goals. But isn't that the advantage of like free market economics, which is if suddenly P Facebook is using it to do stuff, people are like, just go somewhere else. Well, good point. And this is something that my company, QuickDesk, which is involved in secure and intelligent data that we're working on, is potentially empowering the consumer in a way using artificial intelligence to, uh, to, to in effect, protect the consumer from the same tools that are being used uh, against you. Uh, and that's and that's something I think that needs to that, ne that will continue to uh, unfold over the next few years is some sort of uh, leveling of the playing field, bringing that power of technology into your hands, into your computer, to make you uh, smarter and protect you in ways that we are not protected today. I think. In, in that, I, I completely agree. Uh, I mean, last week I was talking with someone about uh, specifically IoT user data 
things like, are you at home right now? And do you go for a run every week? And things like that. And that is data where suddenly we're not talking about whether I liked a photo from a person on, on a website, but like, what am I doing in my real life is being translated. And, and that's stuff where I completely agree. And as that gets into more regulated markets like insurance and things that affect like whether I can go to a doctor for cheap or not, then suddenly I think that becomes a, a little, it, it's just specifically Facebook, like how many times, like I think the scariest thing that could come out about me is like whose photos I look at. Like that's probably the worst thing on Facebook. If suddenly Facebook is like, we're gonna tell people what photos you're looking at, just like, and they'd be like, oh no, they're gonna see I scrolled through some random person's 2006 photo of their trip to like Malta. Like that's gonna that's gonna be a really awkward thing to have to explain that I was stalking someone on Facebook. I, I, I don't know if I ever told you. I had a situation where I'm convinced I almost ended up in Guantanamo. Uh, everybody knows what Guantanamo is. Yes, maybe. Place where the U.S. puts people they think are bad in Cuba. Anyway, I uh, I uh, I was in Los Angeles. I had a rental car that uh, I think I forgot to make a couple payments on, so it may have been reported stolen, uh, or something like that. Uh, I was at a, at, a, at a, what we call a thrift store, where you buy used old things, and I saw a box that looked really interesting, and it, it, uh, it turned out to be a Cessna flight manual uh, for a small aircraft. Uh, I have no desire to learn how to fly a plane, but it was 25 cents for this very impressive box of uh, you know, flight, flight instructions. So I threw it into the, into the trunk of my, of my car, and uh, about a week later, I was at a, at a used bookshop, and uh, I had read a lot of uh, interesting uh, religious texts, uh, you know, the Bible, the Torah, the Bhagavad Gita. I'd never read the Quran, actually, and the Quran was on sale. Instead of like $10, it was $5. So I bought it, threw it into the trunk of my car, and uh, then one day I was coming home uh, from work, uh, and from a shoot, and I made an illegal U-turn, and, and a policeman pulled me over, and he uh, said, what are you doing? And I, I said, I live right here. I mean, I, I know I shouldn't have made this turn, but I live right here. He let me off. And then I started to play out in my head, like, what would have happened? He would have asked me for my driver's license, probably would have found out I had an issue with the rental car, but then he would have probably gone into the trunk of my car, and this is about three months after 9-11. I think that's the most critical part of the story. And he would have found a Cessna flight manual and a Quran, which, if you understood the climate of the time back then, this, was, they would have grounds. definitely wanted to look a little deeper. Now, you, again, we're taking things out of context, and they would have gone to my computer, and they would have seen that I look at websites like, uh, you know, Israeli uh, intelligence websites, and I'm intrigued by the face of hate, so you'd see that I looked at uh, white supremacist websites. And you start to put all these little pieces together, and it makes a compelling case. I'd put myself in Guantanamo. So what I'm saying is that uh, there has to be something in place, some structure in place to protect protect us against the misuse. Now, you'll probably like, go your whole life without yeah. this type of Well, problem. I mean, there's also like illegal search and seizure, which is, well, I guess in the climate of post 9-11, that kind of gets thrown out the window. But yes, I, I completely agree. Yes, I, I think that things can be taken out of context. And I think the biggest fear I could possibly have is that people would overanalyze things you do on a computer. But that's what they do. And, you know, and this thing that I know you're not stalking, but Maybe one day when it turns out that somebody thinks you are stalking, and then they look, they go, ah, he was stalking. And in then, fact. They, then they subpoena Facebook, and Facebook turns over records of my activity on the thing beyond what they keep or beyond what they tell me they keep. And suddenly they see that I looked at 900 photos of, tagged with cat or something, or I don't know what. Or exactly. I was exactly. clicking through articles about, you know, Israeli Palestinian conflict or something. Yeah, I could, that would be a fun conversation to have with the NSA and the guards at Guantanamo. Absolutely. That would be a ridiculous thing to happen. But <laughs> well, but, you know, maybe in our cushy Western world, that's the case. One of the uh, one of the products we have is called uh, One One. It's a it's a it's a uh, untraceable messaging device that you don't you don't even have to log into. Uh, and it was based on a on a platform that we had, a web platform, which was similar. It was all hashtag based and no tr no tracking of IPs, etc. And what we found out was that there are millions of people around the world uh, who were using it because they uh, they run the risk of the things that they say today being used against them tomorrow mm -hmm. in a you can't even say a court of law but like in a town square where they chop their head off you know and 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 this was now and then people of course w w would would jump and say well aren't you providing safe harbor to terrorists and pedophiles you wouldn't know potentially. Uh, you wouldn't know but also they 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 terrorists and pedophiles have never had a problem hiding behind man-made 
virtual construct. So I thought in that case, I thought the, the good outweighs the potential bad. But, uh, but we live in a world where uh, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, uh, a lot of our rights are being impinged upon. Privacy, I think, is a human right. Do you think it's a human right? Definitely. Okay. I, I don't think that everyone should have all of their data. I, if Facebook didn't exist, I think I would have a giant billboard with my life or some, whatever the offline equivalent of Facebook, that is probably how it would be. I already do it. I'm telling you about the time I changed my name and moved to France. So it's not, for me, it's just, I think that I like to give people as much data to inform themselves about who I am. I really liked when, so when I, even at the same time when I changed my name, I had hair that went down to about my nipple. Um, and I really liked the idea of how people judge me based on how you would see me walk up, baggy clothes, whatever, versus once you started talking to me. And I love that moment where I could see where their preconceived notions based on the data they had gathered before they talked to me would be combined with the conversation we just had right. or when we're in the process of having. And suddenly they'd be like, okay, scrap everything that, you know, scrap the box. He doesn't go into the box I put him in at the beginning. Now I have to build a new box. And you can, you almost see the, like the, the things are turning, the neurons are firing. And I really enjoyed that. I love the, like, and, and now I can give people even more data. Like, yeah. I think that's fantastic. And, and I think if I didn't like the value that products like Facebook or Google or, or, or Apple or, or any, anything else providing, I just wouldn't use the product. Like, I don't use Facebook because of like a social necessity to communicate with people. Like, there's like 19,000 products. All my, all my teammates are on Snapchat. I, I appreciate the value of Snapchat because I fill up my iPhone with photos I'll never look at. Like when I want to say hi to my girlfriend and I just take a picture of myself and, and then now I have that on my phone. But I, it's not, it doesn't work for me, so I don't is use it. Is this you or is this a proxy you? Are, are we dealing with the real you or is this, a, is this a, an internet bleeding into the real world persona? I mean, who, who are you anyway? There's the identity question. Um, that, that would be the big one. But I, the two have always been the same thing for me. Yeah. I, it works out, like if, if who I was didn't work out well on the internet, I probably wouldn't be able to do what I do and i just go somewhere else. Where I have always gone with the be yourself and then it'll just take you where you need to go. So I am myself on the internet. Yeah. In myself on the internet is the same offline. Like I used to use Secret before it shut down. I loved this product. You it, loved it? Yeah, because wow. I would go on to Secret uh, Secret was a platform, anonymous messaging, you could create topics and talk shit about people. It was awful. The, the content on there was awful. It just, it was the, it was the bottom of the barrel conversation. But people would go on and say awful things, and I would come on with my little cat smiley face, and I'd say, hi, I'm Liam Bogart from the Rude Baguette. Uh, you're talking about one of my colleagues, or you're talking about someone I interviewed. I'd just like to say I don't think that's right. Uh, I'm happy to talk about why, but ding, 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 and ding, and ding. And actually, I would use anonymous platforms, and I would declare myself and then suddenly, people who normally wouldn't want to say things to me because I know who they are, like you can't email me without me knowing who you are because I have reportive. I instantly know who you are. Uh, or if you don't, and I, I used to also go on there and say I was Liam Booger. Good, and that's great, and no one can tell the difference, and that's that's completely fine. I'm told, and that's I hope you did. But that was really an experiment that just showed uh, the best of uh, of humanity, don't you think? The worst of humanity. The worst. I mean, so bad. Why does why do anonymous platforms always devolve into something like that? I think they don't put enough of a framework in place, personally. For example, as a journalist, it's really great for me to be able to talk to sources anonymously. So I'd love to have a platform very, very similar to Secret, where people could come to me and they could, on one end, confirm who they are, and on the other end, know who I am, but I don't necessarily need to know who they are. Do you think we're moving towards uh, a time, or are already living in a time, where uh, the notion of uh, wanting to preserve some anonymity makes you suspect? To certain people, potentially. But I think that's going to go the same for, like, I mean, what did they do in 2007 in France or a couple years ago in France? You can no longer wear uh, the religious uh, headwear. And, and that, was this, that was that. That was that in real life. The, the, the most interesting part of this for me is, again, this notion of identity. We're used to this idea. We've been encouraged to embrace our sense of self, our identity, to express our individuality. And yet there are parts of the world where that's frowned upon, where you are just a cog in the wheel and you are part of the collective. Yeah. And, uh, those, so those sound like awful places to be. Ooh. And, and, um, <laughs> and that, that's not a physical location. That's like the company you work for or the team inside the company you work for. Uh, and you and I both know that it's a lot better when you choose your own destiny and go and do whatever you want. And when you choose your own path, you get to choose your own identity. And, and, and I would posit that we're entering a, an era now where you don't even get to choose your own destiny. That sounds tough. 
Okay. Um, I, I'd love to talk about this for many, many more minutes, um, but unfortunately we're out of time and I don't want us to be too far behind before lunch because people get hungry. Uh, Kevin, thanks for coming by and talking with us. Thank you guys for sitting in and enjoy the rest of the web today. Thank you.